have to say when Daphne du Maurier once wrote, writers should be read, never seen nor heard. But here I am anyway. Um, the title of my talk, And Then the Murders Began, I noticed that was on the website. Uh, it came from, um, I was listening to a, B B a BBC podcast, Writers, Books and Authors, um, hosted by Marielle Frostrip. And um, she had, I highly recommend this podcast, very good. But she, a guest was on there, and the guest maintained that the first sentence of a book that guarantees it will be a bestseller is, and then the murders began. And so I thought I'd make that title, because everybody laughed on the podcast. It was sort of like British jocularity time, but I, I laughed too. But I'm here tonight to tell you that you're fired. Pack up and get out. You are fired from the job of being the critic of your own work. When you finish something and you start to wonder if it's okay, don't try to answer. You no longer get to decide. Your job is to do the work and put it out and let the world decide. Want to be famous? The only way to get there is through practice and criticism. The only way to get practice and criticism is to make and share your work. Take all the energy you take to judge your work and put it back in to create your work. Now this is easier said than done. I am quoting freely from an article from June 13th in the New York Times, free yourself of your harshest critic and plow ahead. Um, it's by Carl Richards, and I really recommend going online, it's online free, to read the whole thing. I would have made copies, but I heard there were a lot of people here, my copier is kind of small, okay. Okay, so I, that's where I was quoting from, okay. Um, but I, you know, easier said than done, I'm going to repeat myself because I could be the poster woman for critiquing my own work and swooning into despair. Even after years of writing weekly newsletters for various departments at the University of New Mexico and feverishly keeping a personal journal, I had no confidence in what I created. Even taking UNM classes in creative writing and dramatic writing, did not convince me I had any talent. I will reenact. This is a class sitting around a table at UNM several decades ago. Maybe things have changed. But the professor would hand out, hand back work. Silly, juvenile, desultory. I didn't care about those wretched earrings. You know, so you're sitting there and you're getting all this right in front of everybody, but it, it wasn't just me, it was just people in there. And I wonder if it was just being tough, you know, and get used to the publishing world or whatever, but it did not encourage my creative juices at all. And it just encouraged me to go to the duck pond and cry. And that's what I did a lot after these writing classes. So I didn't think I had too much to give. But in 1990, as my the nice man who introduced me said, I was bored in between jobs and still had two of my three boys living at home and thought how much, it would, how much fun it would be to write a book where I could kill off a physics and astronomy professor who was very mean to me when I worked there. <laughs> Changing the names, of course. It was a delicious start of an idea. I had so much fun typing away. Murder, mayhem, revenge, catharsis, all of those things. So I gleefully wrote five chapters. I read it. I thought it was awful. Or as Dr. Seuss would say, it was the spotted atrocious. Oh, I just couldn't, I just couldn't believe I did it. And I was shocked at how bad my writing was. And, and I thought it was trash. Now, I, may, I probably had read a thousand mysteries in my life at this time, in 1990, who knows now. 
and I thought I could do that, but it's really harder than it looks. So I stuffed the dot matrix, printed chapters in a lower drawer, as was already said, and I got a job and never wrote another creative word for 15 years. Recently, I was reading a mystery called The Long Drop by Denise, Denise Mina. She's one of my favorite writers. We're a murderous, dastardly criminal, was also a writer. And he was continually rejected by publishers, but kept at it. Yeah. He was so proud to be introduced to other gang members as Peter, the writer. But as he was about to submit another creation to a publisher, he suddenly had just had it. He yanked the envelope out of the, out of the mailbox, took out his lighter, and set fire to it. His inner critic murdered his writing. Years ago, I went to a goodbye party for a theater professor, Brian Herrera. I had talked to him about starting a mystery. He told me that he was in the process of writing a young adult novel. He introduced me to Lynn Miller. Brian was in one of her writing groups. She had published several mysteries. She told me that she and Lisa Leonard Cook were co-teaching workshops on memoir. Sadly, Lisa died a few years ago she was a wonderful teacher. I signed up. There were about eight of us sitting around a table. I had to write at least 10 pages a week and turn it in. I enjoyed the writing process, the discussion, the critiquing and responding to others' writing. Lisa spoke about how when just sitting down to write and starting to write, the creative power of the right side of the brain flows into the left side of the brain by the action of writing. I experienced this. I could think and fret and worry about what I was going to write. But when I finally sat down and started typing, ideas would come to me that I never even thought of. Not all the time, but most of the time it happened. It was surprising. Um, I later read Ray Bradbury's book on writing, and his uh, advice was, sit down, don't think. And Annie Lamont advised, you get your intuition back when you make space for it, when you stop the chattering of the rational mind. Rationality squeezes out much that is rich, juicy, and fascinating. I had one professor who thought the best plays were chewy, so. I guess it gets you writing and get it all sensuous. Lynn and Lisa used an evaluation technique that resembled one I was taught years ago when I got certified to teach English in the public schools. The sandwich. Speaking first of a positive reaction to a work in the beginning, mentioning anything that can be clarified or improved, constructive criticism, secondly, and lastly, finishing up with another positive reaction. Our work was emailed back to us with comments typed on the right side of sentences. I still have to figure out how to do that. I would put in an attachment, and then they would send it back with this margin on the side. It's a word program. I don't know. But anyway, it's very helpful. So you get your work, and then they're commenting on the side constructively. Not silly, juvenile. Um, our, okay, and that, that's a relief. Lisa, Lynn and Lisa created a safe environment and a calm, reassuring tone. Don't all of us need to know that everything is going to be all right? I look forward to writing every day about my family and my memories growing up in a Macedonian household, which was wild, crazy, and loud. Lynn Miller asked me to join one of her critique groups. I was so honored, excited, and scared. What would I write? I will be exposed. I'm not worthy. But I said yes. Six of us meet every two weeks, and I had to turn in writing on the alternate two-week period. Three of us emailed our writings to everyone in the group and alternated every two weeks. I'm sure that's confusing. We start by saying one thing we liked about the other's work. Then Lynn assigns each of us one piece for a longer response. Then Lynn concludes with her critique. 
I had to really read others' work carefully. But my biggest fear was, when I, when I joined, was what to turn in, what will I write? My group has a poet, two novelists, and two writing their memoirs. What was I? What did I really love? Mysteries. What should I do? What could I do? Why did I join this group? I pulled out five chapters of the mystery I started over 15 years ago. Well, as it was already described, crumpled, dusty, stained, and torn. I retyped it so I could send it off in an attachment. After all this time, I was rather entertained by it, but I knew the group would think it was silly and juvenile. Those words that the professor told me like 30 years or 20 years before were still in my brain. But I submitted it, and they liked it. They wanted more. I was shocked. My inner critic was, my inner critic was wrong, wrong, wrong. Of course, that does not mean they do not have constructive con suggestions. More internals for my, for my narrator, more backstory for some characters, review the reader on some facts, etc. A good critique group will judge your writing on its own terms and suggest improvements accordingly. A bad group will mostly make cosmetic suggestions, change this word, move a sentence, punctuate this, not that, or worse, have a personal or political agenda they urge you to follow. I cannot emphasize the importance of being in a good writing critique group. Writing is like learning a language. One needs response. And it forces me to rewrite, which I used to hate. But now I find it sharpens my clarity about what I want to express. What does my voice want to say? So with encouragement, I let the murders begin. I finished the first book. Before I talk about Murder at the Observatory, I feel like Vanna. <laughs> um, okay, um, I can, okay. Uh, I, I finished the first book. I want to mention there's another book within this book. Um, one of my favorite authors is um, Mario Vargas Llosa, and one of my favorite books of his is Anne Juliet, the scriptwriter. And a radio soap opera is running throughout his book, Anne Juliet, the scriptwriter. And I loved it. I loved it. So my narrator is my narrator is critiquing a bodice ripper western romance novel for a friend and picks it up between her adventures. Actually, when my three boys were little and I stayed at home, my friend Lana Harrigan would come over for lunch with her three little boys. It's kind of a busy place. And I would respond to the romance novel she was in the process of writing. So a trusted friend and a good reader and responder could help too. As an aside, Lana never got that novel published, but wrote two historical novels about on Acoma, and they were published. But she didn't ask me to critique those while she was writing. Maybe that was, it was that bad that probably did it. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about my book some, even though this is going to be on critiquing, but through my critique groups, I developed my book. So I'm just going to have a little of my books. This is real. I feel like I'm like okay. uh, The start of the book finds Caroline Steele, the narrator, bored, confused, out of sorts, bummed out in a funk. She was trying to be a good mother, a good wife, and a good homemaker. She was trying to do the right thing. The effort was driving her quite mad. Was she, what was she going to do with the rest of her life? She wanted more, but she didn't know what she wanted. She was restless. She did not do leisure well. She watched her varicose veins drain. She talked to tomato plants. She feverishly knit a sweater and couldn't stop, even though it was big as a pup tent. <laughs> she ate too many Tostitos. As the comedian Chelsea Handler once described herself, Carol was a hot mess. This was the first September in my entire life that I had nothing to do. Until now, I'd always had three ch young children at home, taken classes at the university, and worked. 
After just a week, I was ready to jump out of my skin and tear my hair out by the roots. I grabbed the one ants. Another long, jobless day loomed ahead. I was a hag without a future. Then Carol was in for a big surprise when the phone rang while she was wandering around the backyard with her dog. It was Faye, my ex-supervisor of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. I knew it. She wanted me back. Caroline, I'm calling to tell you that Professor Cummings was discovered in the observatory Saturday morning, she said without preamble. What was she doing? Tying up graduate students and beating them with her laser wand? Silence. No, she was quite dead. Oh my God! I know she wasn't your favorite person in the world, but I thought you should know. The funeral will be Thursday at the Illinois Chapel. Will the goddess of astronomy be launched into space? Long silence. I had better get serious. Oh, Faye, this is horrible. What did the police say? How did she die? Someone kill her. I exclaimed in a higher-pitched voice with a slight quiver. I was an actress whenever I could land a part. She was murdered. The police will hold a meeting with us. We'll hear the details then. Oh, my, let me know, okay? You can find out yourself. The authorities want you here at noon tomorrow for briefing and questioning. Silence. Why? I asked with a real quiver in my voice. The officer has your name on the list. Why? I asked again like an idiot. Someone in the department mentioned you specifically. Who? I look forward to seeing you. I know your name was on the list. I don't know why. Oh. I look forward to seeing you again. Sorry it's under these circumstances. Yeah, my sentiments exactly. Carol was very upset that the police wanted to question her. She hadn't worked there for two years. Someone must have said something about her and Stella. About their recent phone call. Who? All the unpleasant memories came flooding back to Carol. Stella Cummings, what a piece of work she was. She terrorized staff and colleagues. I always felt that Stella was kept beyond her probationary period because she was willing to teach the huge introduction to astronomy classes with 300 plus students and got excellent evaluations. She got voted outstanding teacher several years in a row. Also, she published regularly, regularly thanks to her army of research assistants. She was a classic academic prize and a bitch on wheels. Carol goes to the briefing. The inspector is very handsome. She daydreams while everyone else in the office is questioned. When the inspector asks everyone to leave the room except for her and Faye, Carol is jolted back to a very tense reality. We found something of yours in Stella's office. Mr. Hutchinson looked at me and reached into his pocket. He pulled out a small object and held it up to me. There was my notebook with a picture of a smiling woman wearing an apron in front of an open door of a full refrigerator. The caption, make your own damn dinner, was scrawled over it. I wondered where that was, I exclaimed. I must have left it in my drawer, desk drawer. How did Stella get it? I don't know, the inspector said, but there are some pretty negative writings about Stella in here. I felt all the blood rushing to my head. I was hot. My ears started to ring. I started to babble. I'm an anxious scribbler. You probably read all my notes taken at Sunday school, my trips to Seattle and New York, my impressions of my son's girlfriends, and all the books I want to read, and my inspirational quotes and mattress recommendations. I started to fade but rallied. It isn't all about Stella. No, you're right, he said, as he flipped through the pages. What an observant person you are. Most entertaining. Reminds me of Cecily's line in The Importance of Being Earnest. I never travel without my diary. Must, one must always have something sensational to read on the train. Thank you. I guess he gave me up a compliment. I didn't mind my writing being called sensational, and James quoted Oscar Wilde. Fascinating. The inspector was rather sensational. I quit my imaginings as he read. Got my hair cut at Stephen's family hair care. I really like his thighs. Stella hates my short hair. She whispered in my ear that I looked like a man. I hate that bit. Well, 
I'm not going to read anything else that she said. <laughs> wide audience here. Uh, I will not repeat. Okay, this doesn't sound good for our narrator, even though she says she has an alibi. Carol's on a mission to track down her Stella's murder, murderer and clear herself. She really wants to help the inspector. Suspicion is building against her from the physics and astronomy staff and her own family. Surprisingly, Faye asks her to come back to the department to work cleaning up their library. This gives Caro a chance to step up her investigation and get to get more deeply involved with a few staff members' private lives. She goes to the observatory, she asks questions, she snoops in offices, she collects facts to share with Inspector Hutchinson. She is surprised at her strong feelings for him. She is surprising herself. She does not feel like herself. And she had to kept, catch up on reading her friend Tina's novel, The Love Crescent. Even though distracted by murder, she resolves to be a gentle reader and responder. I could not concentrate on The Love Crescent, even though Jesse was devouring every inch of Pilar's body in a meadow of wildflowers at the foot of the Rockies. Oh, why doesn't he leave her alone, I grunt. He cooked for her afterwards. Oh, give me a break, Tina. I silently pleaded with the author. Jesse jumped up after their simultaneous, what else? Explosive orgasms, sprinted to a nearby stream, caught a trout with his bare hands, forged for a wild asparagus and mushrooms, and sauteed everything up in a pan of bare grease over a fire. <laughs> with the ready supply of flour and sugar he always kept in his saddlebag, he whipped up a tart with blackberries he had picked before breakfast. <laughs> Meanwhile, P P Pilar cooled her como se llama in a bubbling brook. <sighs> Enough. I put it down. But all Carol thought about was, what did her inspector like to eat? <laughs> Carol's investment. <laughs> Actually, that was the most fun to write in the whole thing. <laughs> um, Carol's investigation results result in threats from a faculty member, Crucial evidence services once again to incriminate her. A beloved family member almost dies. She has to find the truth, and she does. She and Inspector Hutchison restore order. He goes back to New Orleans after his time on loan to the Albuquerque Police Department. With a new sense of personal accomplishment, Carol contemplates a future other than being a wife and mother. So that book was done. What now? My group wanted another one with the same characters. <gasps> oh. So I wrote Murder at the Art Museum. Right, which you know, as you've already, in my introduction, I have worked at the Art Museum at the university. Okay, this book, once again, stars my intrepid narrator, Caroline Steele, who after a year, since helping to solve the murder at the observatory, she has just been hired as a part-time museum shop manager. Unknown to her, Inspector James Hutchinson has once again returned on loan to the short-staffed Albuquerque Police Department to investigate a death at the museum. The museum was closed Monday on her first day of work. A rather unwelcoming administrative assistant gave her a tour. After trudging through three levels, climbing steps, taking elevators, Carol was overdone. My head was spinning, my ears were ringing, my edginess was ground down to a nub. I hung my head and matched Linda's heavy tread. What have I gotten into again? We turned a corner, so did Inspector James Hutchinson. I plowed right into him, I went down. James grabbed my arms, I grabbed his arms. He pulled me up. Mrs. Steele, what a surprise. I could not speak. So you two know each other, Linda asked. Kind of, sort of, I whispered. The inspector was um, questioning the um, art museum staff about the murder of a homeless former art and art history professor who was found bludgeoned to death in the museum's lower gallery handicap lift. Being no stranger to murder, Carol wanted to know all the details. Years ago, the murdered man, Professor Lowry, had taught her contemporary art. He was an excellent teacher and a prolific artist 
How did he become homeless? Who killed him in the museum? Carol was curious and anxious to help the inspector once again. But her job, she once described as a dream job, was not all glamorous. Difficult museum visitors, invisible unsupported museum um, administrators, pushy root donors, and news that her job share partner was quitting and she would have to work full time was too much for Carol. She marched down the hall to pound on the administrative office locked door and to hand in her resignation. She saw her inspector. Mrs. Steele, James said, can you please help me get to the handicapped lift in the basement? I'm quite turned around, and I'm quite ready to explode, I thought. Of course, this building is like a rat's maze. Let's take the elevator down. Follow me, Inspector, I said briskly. I will. I found out some information about the murder victim, I said like a Miss Prim or Miss Pris. Oh, did you now? Well, yes, I did actually. We stood in front of the elevator. I pressed the down button. He used to teach in the art department. He taught me contemporary art 10 years ago. The doors opened. I know, James said as he put his hand lightly on my waist, so I stepped in first. But did you know why he was fired? I pushed the basement button. The doors closed. His hand was still on my waist. Yes, James said. But did you know Roland was on the committee? James drew me close and kissed me. I pushed him away. I was terrified of my feelings. Old school guilt and losing control. I'm married, I said. So am I. I threw my purse on the floor, wrapped my arms around his neck and grabbed his beautiful hair. I don't care. Kiss me again. Really, my books do have murder and mayhem and blood. I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm reading this just for entertainment stuff. I mean, you're going to get a murder in here and lots of bloody, you know, dripping and stabs and stuff. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Later, the inspector and Paul. Oh, she changed her mind. She's not going to quit. Okay. Um, later, the inspector apologized. Carol demurely accepted his apology, but honestly was not that offended. Uh, Carol um, gathered information about the murdered professor and his wife, who happened, and his, the murdered professor and his ex-wife, who happened to be currently married to the museum, to the, blah, excuse me, to the museum director. So the murdered man's ex, the ex-wife is now murdered to the museum director. Hey. Uh huh? Did I say that right? No. What did I say? No. Oh no! Okay, the murder man. I'm sorry. Okay, the murdered man's ex-wife is now married to the museum director. He is not. Who is not murdered? He's still alive so far. So far. No spoilers here. Okay. Um, just kidding. Um, okay. Carol gathered information about the murdered professor and his ex-wife, who happened to be Canadian. Blah blah blah. Okay. She gets it from a colorful homeless man who comes into the museum and hangs around, and she finds out about all these tangled relationships that she couldn't wait to share with her inspector. In her spare time, Carol once again was reading a gothic novel written by her friend Tina, A Cinnamon Summer, about a poor young woman running away from a toxic marriage to stay with her aunt in Long Island. I'll read a bit of it. Okay. Okay. Lily got out of the car. Tulip jumped after her. She knocked on the door. No answer. Hmm. She knocked again louder. Maybe Aunt Geneva was going deaf. She turned around suddenly when she heard a vicious barking and growling. She saw her precious boxer rolled over on her back in the grass. Standing over her, gnashing his teeth and frothing at the mouth, was a huge black and tan Rottweiler. Get away, you brute! Lily threw her African woven purse at the attacking dog. Bruno, come, a voice shouted from the backyard. The drooling dog ran off. Tulip stood up and shook herself. Lily checked her all over, no blood. Oh, what a welcome. Who are you? A deep voice hollered. 
literally tore her eyes away from Tulip to see a man dressed in cutoffs and a wife beater tee. His thick blonde hair was pulled back in a ponytail, his eyes covered by the blackest ray bands. He had a wide chiseled mouth. He wore black high top Chuck Taylor All Star Converse sneakers without socks. He was about six feet tall with a slender, firm build. He must play baseball or tennis, Lily thought all of a matter of seconds. He held a rake. His rude dog wagged its tail by his side. Well, cat got your tongue? The stranger walked close to her, invading her personal space. Lily could smell clean sweat and freshly mown grass. His teeth were so white. <laughs> Lily stood up to her full five foot six inches. My name is Lily. My name is Lily Bar Bartlett. I have driven all the way from Texas. My Aunt Geneva lives here. I'm going to stay. Your cottage isn't ready yet. Come back later. He spun around and walked behind the house. Lily stared at his back, open-mouthed. Bruno scampered after him, and Tula pranced behind both of them. My little girl has no shame, Lily thought. Well, it turns out she won't either, as the novel goes on. So. <laughs> Anyway, but no spoilers there. Yeah, just okay. Anyway, so my narrator, oh, she's going through some things at home. Her marriage is starting to fall apart. She and her husband seem to be living separate lives and finding comfort in others. Carol tries to ignore the high drama at home and in the process deepens her relationship with the inspector. Against his direct orders to her great peril and almost losing her life, she takes matters into her own hands to discover a major forgery in the art world, the prime motive for, mur motive for murder and the murderer. I am halfway through writing Murder at Theater X with the same nar narrator and inspector. I was encouraged to write a third book by my group. Once again, my heroine is dealing with her quirky family. She continues to be torn between her role as wife and mother and the excitement and satisfaction of she feels solving mysteries and having a close, if uncertain, relationship with the inspector. My group advised me, though, not to write another novel within a novel. They want me to use the room that I, and all the creative power I used with the second, with that inner novel, to put more uh, backstory of characters in the book. Um, more internals from, from um, Carol, my narrator. More, what is she thinking? Because in my other book, she's running here, and she's running there, and she's saying this, and she's saying that. What is she thinking? So I, they are encouraging me to do that, which I'm doing. And also, they want me to deepen, and deepen, deepen my descriptions of characters I've brought in a little more. So they're, they're kind of like, they're, they're encouraging me to do these things. All right, I am trying, I'm working, I'm trying not to think, I'm trying not to critique every word I write, and I'm trying to pack up and get out and just fire myself from being so critical of myself. So I have all these words to, to encourage you and I still kind of fall back myself. But I, I keep reading everything, I read all the time, and remember writers are readers, and um, one of my favorite authors is Alan Bradley, and he says, books make the soul float. I, I love that. And I have found also participating in other art forms um, helps my creative writing process, because nothing's wasted. Um, like, I'm in the introduction, I've been in plays and films and musicals, and I've taken jazz singing lessons and performed, and even a drawing class helped. Um, I think what helps with being in other art forms, even singing in church choir, I do that too. Uh, it, it just is part of getting out there, getting out there and doing things out there, which is what I'm encouraging you, you know, get through your writing out there. And I think with these other art forms, you go out there and do your art. And some people like it, some don't, sometimes you okay, sometimes you're not. But you get used to just being out there. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just being open and being out there, doing things. So please keep art in your lives. And I want to um, 
close with um, some very good advice I got from Paul Ford, who is a respected actor, director, and teacher in town. And I was so worried about this role I was given in a play. I didn't think I could do it. I was on 85 pages of script, and I was just like really upset. And I went to him, and I was worried, and he said to me, sometimes you just have to have a little faith in yourself. And that's all he said, and I just think that can apply to so many things in art, and, and doing your work, and, um, and putting it out there for the world to see, and um, it's scary sometimes, but it's very fulfilling in others. And it's wonderful to be around fellow artists, writers here. And I just, um, I wish you all the best. And we just have to, well, it's like it says here, we have to plow ahead in all of this. So. Well, thank you. If you have any questions, then.